Hi everybody, this is Chris Shang. I am the host of Pod Sass, where we put the sass in sassy, and today we have our first in-person guest, Mike Marmo from Curb Waste. He's got an interesting SaaS product, which is essentially software for the waste management industry, where they're streamlining their entire operations. So how does that work? We're gonna find out today. Pod SaaS, where we're putting the SaaS back in sassy. Sponsored by Leader Pro, where you can book demos with target customers on demand and fill your sales pipeline instantly. Welcome to Pod SaaS. <laughs> We've got Mike from Curb Waste today. How's it going, Mike? Going well, man. You How are, are you? our first in-person guest. By design. By design. I want to be here. Um, and you came in from New York. I did. Yeah. 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 I wanted to see the shirt in real life. Oh, the Hawaiian shirt. The 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 holiday. This is Hawaiian very festive. Shirt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the themes here that we got going on is a new Hawaiian shirt every episode. Love so, it. So, you know, if you don't care about SaaS products, at least you can check in and see like which Hawaiian shirt I got on. I don't know. I like it, man. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's on brand. I like it. Uh, is inspired by Chris Saka. I don't know if you know Chris I do Saka. Not, no. Yeah, he's a uh, he's a pretty popular like. Uh, venture capitalist guy and he um he would always wear a different western shirt oh yeah so that's kind of the idea you just kind of like try something different i like it man not take yourself too seriously i'm about it cool why don't you tell us a little bit about curb waste like you're i know you have a business in the waste industry yeah. and then now curb waste is like a software solution for the waste industry but yeah just tell us about you know what your business is um you know the the business that you're selling ultimately also. Yeah. yeah. Cool to kind of hear your journey. Yeah. The story is a little, uh, I guess is a little unique. Um, you know, I've been working in the waste industry for about like 10 years, let's say mm -hmm. about, uh, started at like a, a, a transfer facility, which is basically like where they bring material and they sort it and then eventually goes to like an end user. Um, that was supposed to be something that was kind of like, a you know, you don't really know what you want to do with your life. So yeah. you kind of just like jump into something and temporary and then figure it out. Um, and so I learned the business there and during that time, what was supposed to be like a six month thing ended up being like a four year thing. Um, did you and, do that? So did, did you do that right out of college? No. You... So, so I, um, I had played baseball and then, and then after that I was working in, uh, in media and like, you know, again, I, I dedicated my life to baseball basically. So, you know, when you dedicate yourself to something and then you don't really think about what's going to happen after that. Yeah. So I just never, ever thought about like what my career journey would be. I just yeah. thought like, this is what I'm going to do. Let me just try to figure this out. Um, and I went as far as I could. And then after that, I, I got a job. A buddy of mine had worked at Mindshare and was like, hey, you know, I'll get you an interview. Um, I was an assistant media buyer, you know, and um, it was it just wasn't the corporate thing just wasn't really what I wanted to do. I kind of learned that pretty uh, early. And so I, I just decided, hey, let's let's my, my family had owned a, a transfer station. So I was like, let me just get a job there for the time being. It was close to where I was living, so it's uh, pretty convenient. And that was where I learned the business. And, um, you know, you do a lot in a transfer station. It's like, a, you know, you have obviously office work, but you also are kind of out there and, and learning about materials and learning about trucks and where the materials come from and like how waste is generated and all this stuff. Um, and so it was it was fun and it was it was tangible. Mm -hmm. You know, you're actually like operating like things that matter. Yeah. Um, and so from there, I. Uh, started um curb waste, uh curbside which is our waste company um mm -hmm. and we did that in new york it was basically like a construction demolition roll-off company providing dumpsters um and that was where we really started to understand the needs of the industry itself and so we built a technology platform that we ran the business on and and that like was very iterative it was kind of like started out as just like this like form that we would take orders in digitally mm -hmm. and then it kind of expanded out and just started doing more and more things um and as the business grew the product grew because yeah. we were just reinvesting yeah. in our in our business so um that's pretty much how like the tech play happened um and then once covid happened the city shut down yeah. right so we lost about 3 months of revenue okay and so i was thinking to myself well we have to work from home. We're in a very good situation because we have a system that allows us to do so. Yep. Um, we can keep everybody safe and we don't necessarily have to be at the job. Um, drivers are working with tablets so they can kind of do their thing. There's not a lot of intermingling. Maybe other companies want this too. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just started to reach out to my network 
And I was like, hey, you know, would you want to use a system like this? Yeah. And they were like, yeah, definitely. And I think the need increased because of, you know, the uncertainty of what was happening. Yeah, yeah. For um, sure. And so we just decided to basically re-architect it to be a SaaS product um, because it was built proprietary. So you don't really have all those different components in place yeah. at that time. Um, so we spent most of 2020 just like doing that. Um, and then we branded it and we created Curb Waste and now we're here today. So this is pretty much how it happened. My reference point is like the mafia movies, right? And like, everybody, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a common thing. Um, I get it all the time. Yeah. Um, I am Italian, if, if, if anybody listens to this. So um, I get it all the time. And, and, you know, and it's unfortunate too, because I think a lot of times when people think of waste management, they think of like the Sopranos. Yeah. They think of like, and, and listen, that's a part of the history of some of the parts of the country. Yeah. Um, and, and, but it doesn't permeate now. And I think, I think that part of it becomes a little bit more personal for me yeah. because, you know, I, 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 it's affected me in ways that where I've had people, you know, look at me and judge me mm. just because of who I am or my name or whatever. Really? Yeah. And it's, I mean, I could tell you countless stories about people that have just had no shame in saying to me like, oh, so you're in the mob. <laughs> and I'm just like, you, you realize what that means, right? Like you're literally just calling me a murderer yeah. or a racketeer yeah. or like, like these are things you're telling me to my face yeah. and you think it's fine because, you know, it's, it's in a movie or in a TV really? show, um, but it's not. And yeah. so- you know, that also fuels me in, in arming these waste companies to show them like, like, no, waste companies are legit. Like what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis is yep. making your life better. Yeah. It is. Whether you think it or not, it is. And, and so, and a lot of these companies deal with that. And I'm sure if you got a waste company owner in New York that's Italian on, on this podcast, I'm telling you now, they would say the same thing. Yeah. Because we all go through it. Yeah. Yeah. You mean another one outside of you? Yeah, outside of me. Like, <laughs> like it's just like it's 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 just something that like if you're Italian and you join yeah. the waste business, that's the assumption. Interesting. It's, Interesting. It really is. It really is. But it is. Listen, it's a part of the history. Yeah. There's no debating that. There yeah. was a time where that was a thing. Yeah. Um. But no, I have not been approached by the mafia in any capacity <laughs> to run my business. So we're good. Well, I'm curious, like, why? I mean, last question on the topic, because sure, sure. why is there a history between the, the mafia and, and the waste management business? Yeah, I mean, you know, I the history is pretty much that, you know, again, it's kind of when it falls in that line of like, this is something that's always being generated. Okay. So, so, you know, mafia in general has a, a propensity to in, inject itself into things and they just happen to inject themselves into this industry at one point. Yeah. Um, and so, but again, they also own restaurants, right? They also did, there's a lot of industries that they have found and, and exploited um, and not just the Italian mafia, other, yeah. you know, criminal enterprises as well. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't accept, I don't claim to be the expert on the history, yeah. but I do know that because of those things, you know, it's obviously affected the way people have treated me. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't take it, you know, listen, I don't take it personally. Yeah. I, I understand why it is the way it is. Um, but I, but I'm going to do everything in my power to show people that this industry is above board and it's yeah. important. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just kind of like, it's a constant the, the idea of like, I think any organization that goes criminal or legitimate is like, yeah, you go for the constant, right? Exactly. So it's like, and, and don't get me wrong. Like it's not, you know, it, I think a lot of people that start waste companies, you know, it's not front of mind technology, right? Yeah. The number one priority of every waste company in the, in the world is pick up the garbage, right? Yeah. That's the number one thing they have to do. And so most of the focus goes into that. Um, and I would say from my perspective was, well, you know, I'm a regular user of tech. You use it every single day. You know the value it can bring. Um, how can we best formulate it into this, into this market? Um, and so when I started to learn the industry, you start to learn the real problems, right? Like all great yeah. products solve problems. And so I was kind of living those problems and just like jotting them down and thinking about, okay, you know, this could do this. And you start like trying to find solutions for it in the market. And at that point, when we started curbside, I had demoed every product there was, okay. right? Like I just started going out because I thought, whatever, we're just going to demo products and we're going to use one of those products. Yeah. And I found that everything did, did something, something well, but it didn't do everything well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you're building, when your intention and which our intention was to build this like large waste company in New York, um, you know, you want to be able to grow with it. Yeah. You don't want to just be limited into what its capabilities are. Yeah. Um, and so that was where I was like, you know what, we'll just build our own. 
Like it will start small. Yeah. We understood that, but let's just every profit we make, let's just reinvest in that idea. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we did for like five years. I mean, it was Got really it. kind of just like this evolution. Yeah. We made a lot of mistakes, but there was a lot of evolution yeah. in that tech product. How does one go from like, you know, looking at waste in this in this way that you're that you're looking at it from your lens, right? Of like, yeah. Well, we could use tech to solve these problems. You know, like I'm, I'm, I guess what are the existing methods or before curb waste or in terms of like let's say another another kind of like waste company similar size as the ones that you guys have on curbside, yeah. but like or even like larger than that. What are they doing or what have they historically done to um, accommodate or like, I guess maybe, I don't know if, do, do they ever look at like trying to optimize things or better efficiency or is it really just like, how do they scale or how do they grow? Yeah, I think, so like I said before, I mean, I think most startup waste companies are going to think about it from the lens of the amount of trucks they have, containers they have, the labor force, how many clients do we have, right? Yeah. That's how they're going to kind of focus most of their efforts. And, and what happens there is that typically, if you're not really uh, tech informed, like, and understand that value, then you're just, you're really going to ignore it. You're, you're kind of just going to grunt, you know, work your yeah. way through so you it. you just accept that and you just pain yeah. points is that's part of the That's business. part of it. And okay. so I think culturally speaking, that's what you find a lot of the time. Um, and, and we kind of create this, this denomination of waste companies as you have like your, your, what we consider like a mom and pop, a small business. So those individuals are are just kind of like putting themselves out there They're, and and the waste industry as a whole is a very it's risky in the sense that it's very capital you know intensive mm -hmm. so you know you're taking out loans you're doing all these things mm -hmm. so you're really just focused on we need to get the customers we need to get the trucks working we need to get mm -hmm. you know the containers out we got to get the turnover so um i think that's a lot of the core focus as those businesses start to grow and they kind of fall more into that like mid-size like a small business uh, mid-sized business, enterprise, mid-enterprise. Um, then they start to consider other things, right? Now you're talking about, well, we have the customers, we have the assets, we built the, the revenues are good. What are we going to do to create efficiencies? Mm -hmm. And that's where tech will typically plug itself in. It. Um, and then as those businesses get bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually either, you know, become what I would consider enterprise. Now it's really like, okay, we've maybe outgrown this system. Now we need to go into the big system. Yeah. So, you know, I like to use a comparison of like, you have your small business that uses one CRM and then yeah. they grow and then they get to the bigger CRM. Yeah, yeah. It's a similar kind of thing. Got it. Um, but what we think from a value perspective and what I found is you should have tech from the very beginning yeah. because understanding those efficiencies in the earlier on is going to make you more, is going to benefit you as you grow yeah. because you can make better decisions with your money. Yeah. And that's ultimately what you want to do. If yeah. it's a CapEx heavy business, you need to be able to make better decisions with your money. And so um, that I think is where tech really provides value. So that's what we've been trying to educate people on. Just be like, hey, don't be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. It's going to help you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really where we're at, at least in the industry side. And is there like, I mean, I found it's kind of like easier to go in when you're displacing maybe like a legacy system or, yeah. or if it's like super fragmented, then they have a certain understanding of it. Yeah. Is, is that, that, I mean, when you say, when you look at kind of like there's just the waste management industry as a whole, are they on technology or are they kind of like, in a place where they don't they don't really know what's broken, they don't try to fix it at all, and they just kind of like go through the manual. Um, Cause I found that those are like a little bit, that's harder to upsell or just sell into yeah. because like the tech learning curve is steeper, right? Yeah. Um, and just like trying to get them familiarized with any kind of lingo is like really challenging. But if there's something where it's like, oh, this is 20 years old and we've been using this for decades, yeah. but now here's another version that's like, the 2021 version. I don't know. Is yeah, that, is that I, kind of I like think, what you've seen or is it? Um, I think, yeah. I mean, I think what I was actually surprised to see as many companies as I have that have tech products. Okay. Um, so I actually don't think, I think if you asked me the same question 10 years ago, it might yeah. be a different conversation. But, really? Okay. But I think now there's definitely, they're understanding value. Now the value is kind of limited to certain, you know, very specific problem statements like, like taking orders or billing or dispatch, right? Those are the big three. Um, I think what's happening now is we're starting to see an evolution where the cons their clients are changing, mm. right? So maybe before the, you, you would be out of sight, out of mind, and you just want your garbage picked up. 
Now people are looking for information about their garbage, yeah. where it's going, what are you doing that makes with sense. it? And so now that's forcing the hauler to evolve with its, with its yeah. client base. So the consumer wants more visibility. Oh yeah, 100%. And that's forcing now yeah. these, these- It's kind of like with your, with your like electricity, right? Like yeah. sometimes they send you those reports and they're like, yeah. oh, you're doing a great job. You're doing this compared to all your neighbors. Yeah, That's what's kind of happening in the waste stream too. And I think that also kind of makes sense because waste, in my opinion, was always a utility. Yeah. And a lot of people don't view it that way, but it actually is. It's a fundamental part of our life yep. and our health. And so um, I think people are starting, uh, like, you know, people our age and, and younger are buying homes, yep. they're opening businesses, they're now becoming leadership positions, and this is what they want. They yep. want to understand they're more socially what's conscious. Going. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So when they're, when it's, it's forcing the haulers and the facilities to start to kind of uh, solve that issue and yeah. be like, okay, how do we get this to them? That's super interesting. I mean, it's it's really interesting to me when you kind of, when you're like starting to think about it in like a socially conscious perspective, where you know it's like, yeah, global warming is real, and you have a lot of these initiatives talking about the real life impact of what we're doing and how it influences or or, or changes the environment. And then yeah. now it's like trickling down to where now the consumer is in power to kind of like state these demands, state what they're looking for, and then changes the infrastructure yeah. of how things are done. And they're also used to it, right? Like, yeah. like, like we've grown up in a way that we can see everything in, in full transparency exactly, yeah. at the click of a button. So if you're gonna tell people like, yeah, we're gonna provide you a service of your business or your house or something, the, it's almost like just the expectation. Yep. They don't even think twice about it. And when you don't have it, then all of a sudden it's like, well, why don't you have it? Yeah. And that can help make a decision you know, for, for someone using one hauler versus another. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, we want to empower the hauler to have those capabilities so that they don't lose the business. Um, I'm a hauler first, technology second. Yeah. Right? I really, I understand how hard it is. So it, it's such a difficult job that just layering these things in, it, it makes people be like, well, why, you know, we're already doing so much. Why mm -hmm. do we have to do more? Um, and I think software allows that to just be a little bit easier for them to maintain. Do you, when you go into one of these like pitches or one of these conversations, right? With like when you're demoing a product, yeah. you know, are you leading with, uh, are you leading with like how this is going to make their lives easier? Or are you leading with like this is how you can help grow your business? <laughs> well, we're learning it. Yeah, uh, we're learning what works and what doesn't. Honestly, from just the sales side, you know. Um, but I think I usually my format is tell me what your problems are. Like what are what are what are the issues that you run into on a day to day basis? And that can be something along the lines of some people have, you know, just transparency issues, what's mm -hmm. actually happening in my business. Some people have, you know, uh, we'll get a lot like I have to stay yeah. up all night to bill my customers because, because you know, I'm on the truck all day yeah. or, or we we're, we're operating all day. Um, so whatever that problem that they tell us is that they're trying to solve, because if they're on the demo, there's a reason yeah. they're, they're trying to figure something out. Yeah. Um, we want to curate the demo to make sure that we're targeting that and being as specific as we can in that while also showing them all the added value that we can bring. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that's the way we kind of perceive it. It doesn't necessarily always go that way. Yeah. Sometimes they're just like, just show it to me. You know, I want to see everything. Um, and that just changes the dynamic a little bit. What is, what is a typical day in the life of a hauler? Oh man, that's a, that is a loaded and heavy question. Um, <laughs> I can only imagine, right? Like I'm just thinking about this and I try to like visibly like have a vis visual in my head yeah, of like man. what happens and what the process is like, right? So, you know, like I take out, let's just say I, I have a bunch of waste that I need picked up, right? right? And I've categorized my waste as a consumer. And then what happens from there? The life of a hauler depends on who, how big the company is and, and kind of like where they're operating out of. I would guarantee, I could speak to the New York haulers because I, haulers, because I know them very well. Um, it, it's a grind. It's a grind because what people, I think what people don't really understand is how many voices are in the room when it comes to running a waste company. You have obviously all your operational elements. Yeah. You're dealing with office staff, you're dealing with drivers, you're dealing with mechanics, you're dealing with, you know, all that day-to-day -day minutia of getting the job done. Yeah. And it's also a heavy duty industry. So things break constantly. Mm -hmm. So now you're dealing with all the different vendors, all the different parts, all the different, like if a truck breaks down in the middle of the highway, how do you handle that? Yeah. You know, you have to know all these different layers of, of what can happen. And that's true, I think, across every single waste company in the world. You know, they're going to be dealing with those situations. You're dealing with new technologies, new trucks, you know, trucks have computers where they used to be mechanical. Mm -hmm. So you have all these different 
areas that people have to have. And now with, you know, with EVs and stuff, it's even just adding an additional layer. Um, the other part of it is, is that the waste industry is highly regulated. So I you're, see. you're dealing with regulatory bodies that have certain mandates. And like, for example, in New York, you know, you have all these different government bodies that, that license you and that monitor you, that kind of pay attention to what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, then you can deal with local municipalities. So if you work in Long Island in the suburbs, you have to, every single town has their own rules and their own permitting. So that in and of itself is a full-time job that, yeah. to be maintained. So I, I, I sympathize with that struggle to run in a really efficient waste company. Um, and really like the tech product that we're building is just to make their life easier. Mm. Like that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. The, it's more mission focused than it is, you know, to build a SaaS product. It's like, yeah. we want to make, I want to make their life easier. I want to bring value to what they do. And, and I want to make sure that all the things that they're going through, that we have some kind of way of making that a little bit more simplistic. It's been one of the hardest things personally that you've ever gone through. Um, I've, I've found, and I've, I think kind of like just, um, anecdotally, just when I read interviews of like, you know, entrepreneurs that I'll look up to or aspire to, you know, a lot of them have lost somebody significant in their life. Sure. Um, not saying that that's a prerequisite, but I do feel like that creates sub, sub some, some kind of subconscious thing. I relate to that cause I lost my, you know, my dad. Um, but like, that's, I feel like there's something there that connects, connects it. Um, have you ever lost anybody by the way? And like, I mean, and nothing, nothing like in my, fortunately, nothing in my direct family, mm. uh, you know, as a, yeah, fortunately. Um, but I think, you know, I think the most, probably the most, and I also stole that question, FYI. Um, yeah, I got a couple <laughs> from you and I've got been it. using them. All right. um, and, and it makes, and the, and the logic makes total sense. Um, but I think one of the hardest times that I went through was not relatively recently. Um, so I have a very good friend that we grew up with, you know, since high school, he's my best friend. We, we've, we've gone through and we could not be more opposite as yeah. people. Um, but he is, he's, he's as close to a person as he's like a brother. Mm. And, um, and I would grow up in his house and, and, you know, his mother had gotten cancer. And so during that time, you know, as that was going on and you kind of start to see like, you know, how, how her life is changing yeah. and she was, and like I said, I've kind of, I've been very fortunate where I've been surrounded by people that have been entrepreneurs and, and she was, you know, uh, a top performing real estate agent in, in New York. Um, and she was just a, an absolute beast. I mean, just no bullshit, just straight, like, and really just, it's so impressive. And and I used to, you know, I would admire her because I would be like, you know, she would just be grinding all the time. And she didn't, she had, she didn't give a shit. Like she would tell you exactly how she felt about everything that was going on. Um, and so, you know, when she passed, that was really tough because we were all very close and just to see my friend go through that as well, yeah. was like, was really, really hard. Um, and so that was definitely probably the, the, the toughest from a, from a tragedy perspective that yeah. I've gone through. Um, but, but also, you know, you take, you know, she lives with me forever. Like we, my son, his name is Michael James and we call him MJ and her name was Marilyn Jenny. And so we, her, we always called her MJ. So it's kind of an homage to her. Um, but yeah, I think that's the hardest, but she's, um, you know, but being surrounded by people like that has motivated me. Yeah, I yeah, learned, yeah. you know, yeah. what the grind is. Yeah. That's really what it comes down to, like learning how to grind. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I love those kinds. I mean, those, those people, those, that characteristic of just like that no BS attitude. Oh I mean, you, you know why they got to where they got to. Oh, no, she was a savage, yeah. dude. She was an absolute savage. I've seen her just rip people apart yeah. because it, like she didn't have any, like like when, when I heard, and I learned a lot about sales from her because she would like, you know how sometimes when you're in the sales process, people start negotiating against themselves. Mm -hmm. They start to get a little scared of the decision, right? Mm -hmm. So, so like I used to hear her on calls for for these, and she would sell you know two million, three million dollar homes, and these people are you know obviously it's a big, big financial commitment, yeah. and, and big, making and anytime you buy a home, it's a big yeah. financial decision, and and she would just be like <laughs> almost yelling at them in the point where she was like, you know, you want to do this, D like stop trying to and 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 like walking them back away from the ledge in a way that was forceful, but also like. I, I'm here for you. I care about you, but you're being dumb. Mm -hmm. And here's why. Mm -hmm. And and I learned so much from that. I was like, you know, sometimes you really just gotta tell, you gotta convince them that that not to out convince themselves. Yeah. 
because it's it, ultimately that might happen yeah. and, and they don't have a good reason for it. It's just emotion. Yep. And so, you know, I learned, I learned some things there and, and I just went through it. Like yesterday we were talking to a client yeah. and he was, he was like, I don't know if this is going to work. I was like, it's going to work. Just trust me. It's going to, and you know, you have a certain cadence that you can talk to them with. Yeah. That they, they believe you. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, it's true because the passion is coming, exactly. coming out. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, yeah, she was, uh, she, I definitely told her, learned a ton from her and, yeah. uh, and yeah, it was, it was, it was obviously sad, but, but she, she started, you know, her spirit still lives with us right now. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest takeaways from any kinds of kinds of experiences like that is, you know, uh, the perspective, right? I yeah. think there's, there's a tremendous amount of perspective and even through osmosis, through your, this, this guy who is a brother to you. I mean, I'm sure like you're, you're getting a lot of that energy, that a lot of that feeling from him of like, oh yeah, what he's going through. Right. And, um, and there's no way for it not to affect you if somebody that close to like, so, you know, is there, was there any like kind of changes in perspective or any realizations or just kind of like appreciation or being more yeah. present? Any of those kinds of things? That My you entire think? life is changing the perspectives. You yeah. know, you just, I think as you do, as you start to like put yourself in the arena and, and make mistakes and, and like, you know, and, and just live your life, um, you got to adjust the way that you think you have to adjust your like i'll give you a couple examples like i remember so i played baseball in europe and and it was post college i i went to italy and i played baseball there for two years professionally and you know, it was a goal of mine to try to get paid to play baseball and it just happened to be in europe where it happened um it was the best two years of my entire life and it was a formative two years because i learned how to be basically like you know you're a total fish out of water yeah i couldn't speak the language i could, i had no idea about the culture like that culture i knew italian american culture i didn't know that culture yeah. um and i didn't know a single person so where, where in italy were you reggio emilia was the town okay um so it's like between parma and bologna yep yeah. um and so and i and i went there and i knew nobody like like the, i landed and i just got off the plane and i went to a practice and i couldn't understand a single thing what was going on like I'm playing the game I played my entire life yeah. and I have no idea what the hell they want me to do or how, how to do it. <laughs> so I'm like, and fortunately there was an American guy there who spoke to, so you know, you have a translator, but like as I went there as one person and I left there two years later as another person because mm. I had a perspective, a totally different perspective of like what it is to feel uncomfortable. I was totally uncomfortable, but I, I just embraced it. And I was like, okay, we're going to figure this out. And, and slowly but surely you start making friends and you start kind of like almost immersing yourself in the culture. And, and it was like, and it, it totally changed me, I think as an individual, cause I just start to, I started to be able to put myself in other people's lives, mm -hmm. like other people's minds. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able to travel and do a lot of different things that, you know, I was very, very fortunate that I was able to do. And I got to learn all these different things about how people live their life. Yeah. And, and you get to take pieces of that, like morsels of it and just put it into your identity. Yeah. And, um, and so that was definitely like probably the most formative experience of my entire life. Um, but then, you know, obviously just like going through your, your day to day, like, you know, starting curbside was formative, like going into the waste industry was formative, learning corporate was formative. Like all of these things compiled into this, like me being confident enough to say like, let's take a chance. Mm -hmm. Let's go for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think without those things happening, yeah. I, I would have done it. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I think but you probably went through something like that, right? I yeah, I mean I did. I mean when you say that too, I just thought of like I spent my, you know, I I was born in Chicago, grew up out here in LA for the most part, moved out here when I was like 8, 10 years old. Um, but I spent my last year of high school in Hong Kong. And that was like a fish out of water, so I'm Chinese, but like going to Hong Kong where they don't speak a lick of Mandarin, it's can't it's a different right, dialect right, entirely. Right. So it's kind of similar to you being Italian, Italian American and going to Italy, right? Like just immediately thought of that and i was like you know but that was a formidable period because i ended up deciding to go to nyu as opposed to like i know all of my friends most of them stayed in la area or went to college in, in california as opposed to staying in the west coast as opposed to like taking any of those bigger risks and obviously then going to nyu is also formative and that experience of living in new york city so um it was it's just funny though like i feel like there's these little little nuances that happen in, I think, like people who end up in a certain place. And there's some certain commonalities and threads that tug along those things. And like 
exposure to to different cultures and lifestyles i think is a big one you know and i think that's something that you just kind of spoke about and and then it just that can be a jump start to a lot of different things um i also know personally for me it's like the different friendships and relationships and people taking a chance on me at different times yeah. um has made a huge you know impact on me in terms of like where i've been able to realize a lot of the successes that i have and super appreciative like i definitely have a lot of these reflective moments today and and every day almost like where i'm like oh shit this is where i was like five years ago six years ago ten years ago and um and it's just a night and day difference well i do have a question for you yeah so so, and this might be a little bit like uh, getting a little heavy but uh do you ever think about like your legacy like as a life like do you ever think about a point where you're like what is my legacy going to be when i die oh absolutely yeah i I don't know why i think about that (laughs) i do think about that quite a bit um and i don't have a great answer other than the fact that i think about and i think just thinking about the idea i want to leave a legacy and what is my legacy going to be is enough where it's like i i think it's always going to be something you chase and something that you try to be better at leave a better version of that you know i know that um I want to make the world a better place. I then then I then I entered it. I know I want to be able to um I think inspire people to a certain degree to take chances to look at whatever they're afraid of and yeah. like not worry so much about outcomes and take risks that are with you know na- the next level of risk that's outside of their level of comfort. You know being able to instigate a little bit of that um in whatever form it is. You know like and I don't know if it's like going out and starting your own business or like just, you know, overcoming a fear of something, you know, I think like we all live in a lot of fear and I think, um, that it it did come from like being in Hong Kong and like spending a year abroad and then going to like New York and then being basically alone in New York city. I, I mean, I remember like I went there in the August in August of like 97 and it's like, um and i was just literally like in a dorm by myself for like a month and a half before the actual year started forgot why why i was doing that but it's like um but yeah i was just literally like walking around the city trying to figure my shit out yeah man and that there's something that, that does you know that changes you in a lot of ways i think it's really about like like i always it's like the runner like adage like you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable and and that is like I love that one, yeah. but that and that's so true like you have to just you learn that that's yeah. something learned yeah i don't think like some people are born with it i guess like if you're like an extreme athlete or whatever but yeah. but for the most part like you can learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable and and i definitely didn't have that when i first left and i and i didn't even you're not even i wasn't even cognizant of the fact that that was the case yeah. like i was just like you know you live your life and everything's very comfortable and you have everything with you and then when i was like a fish out of water i was like Oh shit! Like you know, I got <laughs> I got to figure this out, and and I was and to your point too, like and it's a great point is that I was really lucky that the people that were there, I ended up in the best possible place for me. I ended up with the best possible people, and like like I have, there's two different people that really like during that time were incredibly influential. One of them was my teammate. He was a Canadian guy, Chris Falls, uh, his name. And he was like a veteran of the European circuit. Yeah. He had been played there like six, seven years. He had played in France. He had played in England. He had played in Germany. And he was coming to Italy to play on this team. And he just like showed me the ropes of like European travel in a way that I would have never knew. Um, and he made me super comfortable with like using train systems and and just like using public transit and doing all these different things that I probably would have shot away from mm-hmm. just because I didn't want to be like, that that loser tourist that was trying to yeah, yeah, yeah. and he was like don't worry about it and was and and so like he taught me that and we went and we traveled everywhere like we used to get on a plane on like or like like a Ryanair or an EasyJet on like a Sunday night and then we come back for practice on Tuesday and we would just go to a different place and then we spend like months just traveling staying in hostels doing all this stuff things that I would have never that's, done that's that's fucking never amazing. done that's awesome and and I got to see so much of Europe because of it and it was just because of him honestly and then the second year you know I taught other people how to do it um, and then the second thing was like, you know, there was this family and my friend, um, his name is Taka, Andrea Taka, Taka, Takashi, and his mom is Japanese and his dad is Italian from Reggio Emilia. And they like basically took me in as family and they they just 
like I, I view them in a way that like they literally are family to me. They without them, I wouldn't have like like you know even just going to the store was tough. Like getting yeah. food and like all this stuff, and they would feed us. They would like they would just invite us out, and like he just basically took me and integrated me into his friendship group. And like before we knew it, like you know we'd have something. I had friends and I had things to do, and and um, and that friendship grew because he had gone to Oxford to study English and he was working on his English and like so we would just bounce like this this these cultures back and forth to yeah. each other and then eventually he would ended up coming to New York which he would have never done and he spent like a couple of years in New York yeah. so it's like it's amazing how when you put yourself out there and just like start doing things again just becoming comfortable with that feeling of non-comfort yeah. um, that that like amazing things can happen um, and I think again like I, it's already happening even down to like, you know, we're sitting in the mucker office. Like, yeah. you know, that was completely random how that happened. Yeah. Um, and I just took a chance to, to make a contact and and it ended up working out. And then I met you and now we're here. So, yeah. you know, all these things kind of happen if you just put yourself out there. Yeah. And now you're chasing something else uncomfortable. And now we're going <laughs> trying to trying to build something really I special. Mean, I mean, I smile in ear to ear on that idea because I that that statement that you said getting comfortable with the uncomfortable is something I a hundred percent agree with. Yeah. And I think like so many people don't challenge themselves enough or never, I guess maybe aren't lucky enough to be put into those kinds sure. of situations. Yeah. Um, and if you're not kind of like serendipitously put into those situations, maybe when you're younger, it becomes harder and harder. I think as you get older. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, luckily we both were kind of forced into these situations and um but i i chase that all the time and i feel like that idea of being uncomfortable is just it's like a muscle right it's like the more you can tolerate a certain level of discomfort all of a sudden becomes your new standard of normal and comfort yeah. and then you keep pushing that boundary and um and i think most people it's just not as exponential and it's probably you know, they challenge themselves in a certain way, but then they pull back. And, yeah. and I see this, I mean, I, I see this in kind of like different people in my family and, and, you know, people that they're, they're significant others or they're in, in friends and stuff like that, where it's yeah. like in conversations, you know, they'll, I'll, I'll challenge, present a challenge in some way. And they're like, I would totally love to do that, but, da, 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 sure. and, you know, pull back, you know? Yeah. And, um, but yeah, there's definitely something to be spoken to that experience and then how it translates to a lot of, I think, uh, ripple effect. Ultimately. Yeah, and I, and I think, listen, there's certain people that have that and and learn and want to learn it and and there's other people that don't. And you need both, though. Yes. Like, you really do. Because mm -hmm. if, if, you know, there's definitely situations where, you know, my ideas and my thought process get a little too grand. And I'm just like, you think balance. Of, and I'm like, someone's got to reel me in. Yeah. And, and fortunately, we have people that can reel yeah. me in. And, and so like, you know, and then there's sometimes where, you know, the, the person, because you need like any great idea, no matter what it is, no matter where it is, no matter whether it's business or just in general life, you have to have people that help execute that idea. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like, you can't have every single person in your organization being like this dreamer. Yeah, and being this, so you need the execution aspect and you need the ideas and the vision aspect and, yeah. and when you can kind of create that symmetry and bring that together then ultimately you have something that's going to be effective and yeah. so i think you know there's, and there's sometimes that like i understand where my flaws lie where i maybe don't i should be focusing on something more than i am and maybe it's just because i'm on to the next thing and 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 that's not really productive yeah like you know just focus on where we are right now yeah and so you know it, it's really a balance you got to kind of balance it but i think ultimately if you're going to be an entrepreneur and you get uncomfortable you're kind of screwed like you know you really got to focus on, on on trying to just put yourself out there and just move the needle every single day consistently mm -hmm. forward to your point to create that new level of what comfortable actually is yeah that's awesome i mean i think um yeah, on that point, I feel like that's probably like the biggest takeaway I can say from this yeah, from this conversation and just from from what we were talking about the whole time uh is just keep pushing and your level of discomfort until it becomes comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And that's probably like a good piece of advice for anybody who's kind of like sitting on the couch or like sitting in their cubicle or whatever it might be, whatever their current environment is that they're like want to shake it up a little bit it's sure. really just that it's just kind of push it a little bit 
get comfortable there and push it a little bit more. Yeah, man. It's just like it's like in fitness or working out. Like you just yeah. got to keep going. It's going to yeah. suck in the beginning, but yeah. you know, ultimately you start to see those gains or you start yeah. to see, you know, your your time increase or whatever, yeah. and then that that becomes the new barometer and then yeah. you just want to keep beating that. Yeah. So, you know, you can't just it, staying stagnant gets you nowhere. Yeah. So, you just have to continue to push and and I think we just try to you know, I know you do it and I know I do it where I'm just trying to bring when you're bringing a product to the to the marketplace, you just want to you have to educate about what that product is and then you have to kind of just keep improving it and keep making it better and keep making it better and keep making it better. So it's never stagnant. Yeah. And that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. On that note, we're going to end it. I think that's, this is fun, that's, man. that's a good piece of advice for everybody. This is great. Um, yeah, this is this is amazing. It's, it's great to have you as our first in-person guest. And, I, I'm honored. Um, <laughs> I'm honored. And uh, probably do a follow up at some point here as you as you kind of like get further along in your journey. Have you back, and That'd you know, awesome. hopefully, you got your hundred person team, and <sighs> you guys are kicking it and on your uh, way to being a unicorn. So it'd be awesome. Uh, it'd be it'd be a dream come true. Yeah. So we'll, we'll continue to try. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank you, man. It was, it was really awesome. good. It was to have really you. fun. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. And if you like what you heard today. Please tune in for future episodes by subscribing below. And if you enjoyed it, give us five stars. We love the high ratings and uh, hopefully you enjoy the next future episodes.